ahead and get us started, Elizabeth. Um, so yes, welcome, welcome. This is, um, we are Get Connected by Galaxy Digital. And my name is Court McCracken. I am she, her pronoun. And um, we are here today to talk about virtual volunteerism, engaging remote volunteers in a digital world, um, which has been on the forefront, we know, of many uh, volunteer managers' minds the last few years. And um, again, use that chat. We are really looking forward to um, talking with you there. Um, we do have live trans transcription closed captioning available down at the bottom of your Zoom window if you would like to enable that. And I'll just go ahead and give a little flyover engaging virtual volunteers. What is virtual volunteer? So the two goals we're really going to talk about today is what is this evolving definition of virtual volunteer? Because it's not that old of a, of a definition. I think it was first coined in 1995. So it's a relatively young concept. Um, and we've noticed a lot of changes there. So we really want to talk about that. And we really also want to talk about engaging these unique volunteers. Um, so again, my name is Court and I work here at Get Connected by Galaxy Digital. I have the joy of being a creative communications and outreach specialist here. Um, if you're not familiar with us, Get Connected is our best in class volunteer management software serving thousands of organizations across North America. And it's designed specifically to meet the needs of volunteer managers and their programs. So we really care about um, volunteer managers. And that is why we're excited that you're here with us today. So thank you for your time. And uh, we'll also have Elizabeth Donovan. Elizabeth is our networks liaison. She leads the Get Connected team in understanding the challenges that are facing nonprofits in working with their volunteers and kind of balancing those needs of recruiting, engaging, retention of volunteers, and of course, growing your community's impact because you care about your cause and making a difference. And Elizabeth brings over a decade of experience supporting United Ways and consulting with nonprofits across the nation, providing a unique take on the most practical and simple strategies that real world nonprofits are implementing every day to create sustainable programs with measurable results. We also have Mike Corgan, who is here from our Get Connected Networks team, and he is joining us today. It's his first time on one of our Get Connected webinars. So thank you, Mike, um, because Nate is on vacation. So if you've been to our previous um, webinars, you've seen Nate. And Mike and Nate work together pretty closely. So we're just really overjoyed to have Mike here. He's going to manage the chat box where you can ask your questions and cross-pollinate ideas, share what's working, what hasn't worked, um, and ask questions about resources that may be helpful for you. So we'll all work together to keep this a really healthy and respectful space because um, we have folks who are maybe brand new to volunteer management and those who have been doing this for a while. So this is, you know, a really good chance to just recognize the beautiful sort of diversity of, uh, of what volunteer management means uh, in different organizations. I'll go ahead and I'll start the screen share. <laughs> this is the part that's always really fun for me. <laughs> Don't feel like I'm a strong screen sharer, but I'm working on my screen sharing skills. All right, let's see. Presenter view. Is that right? Nope. Let's start from the beginning. There we go. Can everyone see okay? Actually, I don't think I did it correctly. I'm going to try one more time. Kind of share, right? You're correct. You're correct. Start from beginning is what I needed to do. Oh, Elizabeth, this is where I know I so little, but I know it well. <laughs> <laughs> this is where there it I is. To learn. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your graciousness. All right. So, virtual volunteerism, engaging remote volunteers in a digital world. So what we'll cover today is discovering more virtual volunteerism options for your program. So that's exciting. If you've been feeling a little bit stuck or not sure how to implement virtual volunteerism, hopefully this expanded definition will support that. So we'll talk about what is virtual volunteerism, the benefits and challenges of virtual volunteers, which probably many of us are familiar with at this point, and how best to engage virtual volunteers. Um, stay to the end because we're going to give you three to four practical tips on engaging your virtual volunteers. And the topics that we're going to go over today are what has changed in virtual volunteerism since 2020, 
How can virtual volunteers contribute to your mission? And what tools and practices are needed to really engage those virtual volunteers? So what is the definition of virtual volunteerism? Well, this is the traditional definition as coined, I believe, in 1995 and sort of widely accepted is that virtual volunteering is any volunteer activity that a participant can do online. So um, some people also call this cyber volunteering. Um, really, it's just anything that a person with a computer and a connection to the internet can do. Um, so what we're seeing, though, is that in the last couple of years, people are looking at more of a hybrid digital first sort of model. And so that very traditional, like, computer, internet connection, very specific tasks are really expanding. Mm -hmm. um, so now the evolving definition, and again, this is very in flux, so it's kind of fun to talk about something like this, um, but virtual volunteering can now also include this idea of remote volunteering. So because of shifts that have occurred in 2020, as we all know and intimately experience, the necessity for digital first options has become very clear. So now the volunteer to organization relationship is often managed virtually. Um, and so some of that has been really interesting because even volunteers who maybe weren't engaging with your organization online a couple of years ago, now that might be the first way that they're engaging or re-engaging with your organization. So I'll be interested to hear in the chat box and Mike, you can tell us like, have you noticed that at your organization? I think that's an important question to ask. Um, and here's where some interesting statistics uh, sort of come in. Virtual volunteerism opportunities increase. So just the opportunities that organizations were offering um, from 32% to 51%, and that alone was in 2020. Um, and participation in virtual volunteerism in 2020 increased from 17% to 29%. And now what we're seeing um, for 2021, one poll said that nearly 67% of volunteers reported finding their volunteerism opportunities online. And the projection is for 2022, this year that we're currently in with five months left, if you can believe that, um, that that is going to increase again, actually. So the future of volunteering is hybrid. Um, traditional virtual volunteering kind of each supplementing each other. Um, so this has been something that's been really interesting to, to talk with Elizabeth about um, in the sense that like, what are these trends? What are these things that we're seeing? So what does a digital first hybrid even mean? And so if you're kind of viewing it from that perspective of the fact that a lot of times like the management of the relationship may be virtual, but perhaps the person does the activity on site um, without supervision, or maybe they do show up on site, but perhaps every other sort of aspect of their volunteerism interactions with your organization may be online. Mm -hmm. um, so Elizabeth, if you want to kind of bop through some of these here, yeah, that would be amazing. I think um, just to steal Mike's thunder, I think Shirley's kind of hitting it nail on the head in the chat. It's just not something we're all naturally good at. It's kind of a statement. Um, and that's what I'd say, that's the challenge, but I'd say also kind of a little of a misconception because I think we're good at it. It's just doing it in a different way. And I think when you shift how you're doing it, you know, ease of engagement, online sign up, you know, collecting information before they come in the door versus having them come in the door first. And that's where the engagement starts. It's a little bit of just like rechecking yourself. Um, I think we talk about this a lot internally from a you know, product side, like we do have a software. So we're in it so much when we're developing something that we end up calling things certain things or we have our own way of describing it. And you almost need this person that once you're done, steps in off the street and says, you know, read this. What does this say to you? What do you think I'm asking you to do first, to do second? You know, what questions do you have that I didn't answer? It's almost that that naive set of eyes challenges us. And I think that's where I'd say it's hard, but it's not impossible. It's just realizing 
I didn't get it right the first time because I didn't realize what makes perfect sense to me that of course you're going to park in the back parking lot when you're there on your own versus the front door. That makes perfect sense to me, but I didn't convey it. So now I had someone trying to come in a front door where the key was to the back door. Yeah, you know, I think those pieces of just thinking through with someone outside your organization that didn't do what you're doing, that's a big piece of it. Um, and I think it is, it's taking all these different pieces and starting to weave them together so that they make sense for you to manage. And I think, Court, you're always good about saying, you don't have to do all of this. You know, you're yeah. going to see a, some of this fit your organization and some of it would make no sense for your organization. Yeah. So I think take that piece and that approach today as we talk through things, what are the ones that really kind of resonate with you? That's something you really want to dig deeper on. And what are the things that you're like, that's not me. Maybe that's me in two years, but we're not even close to that. So I'm going to put that aside because I only have so much time. I only have so many resources and, you know, it's a new challenge and how long it takes to get past that new challenge so that you now have an automated way of doing something. If you do too much at once, nothing's going to get done well. And I think that's that piece of what can I do well that I want to focus on incorporating first. Right. And it might just be one piece of it. Mm -hmm. You know, these are just options. Um, and I will say, you know, it's funny because you were mentioning that getting a fresh set of eyes, mm -hmm. um, is always really great. And I love to, if I work on a digital kind of communications piece, I love to share it with somebody who doesn't know anything about what I'm trying to accomplish. And then I just want to hear what they have to say, because that's how I learn whether or not I was clear and, you know, you can do that. Like if you're implementing new pieces of a process, I, you know, exactly what Elizabeth was sharing, like share it with somebody who maybe doesn't know your work intimately well, or who hasn't volunteered with your organization. You know, we've all got one friend who's probably just as busy as we are and can't be in part of the activities that, you know, I'm doing and that they want me to be, but I can ask them, like, do you have five minutes to read this and tell me? Does it make sense or do you have questions, right? Because the questions that they have are the ones that are going to help you be even more clear. Um, and so I I like to, to approach stuff um, like this is like, I'm always learning. And I was actually in a volunteer training situation the other day too, um, where I was assisting somebody who was the lead trainer. And I realized like, she is so talented. She's done this for like, so many years, like she's like got 40 years of experience doing this one particular task. And she was training a couple of brand new volunteers. And sometimes there's just those things that you do so automatically. They're such a part of your, um, you know, repertoire of what you do every day that it becomes um, almost hard to sometimes say them out loud. And so it was funny because I don't have as much experience as her, but I, I was kind of in the middle of her and the new people. And so I was able to say, oh, like this, is, like what, what she did was actually three steps, you know? And so it's always helpful to have people with um, different eyes and different voices to kind of um, bring it all together. So it, it takes, it takes a community to build some of these processes mm -hmm. too. Um, so that was a fun, um, fun thing for me when my, my life, you know, models the things that we're talking about <laughs> in work. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, one of the things is just you could just ask, how could I make this just a little bit easier for someone to sign up online? How could it be just a little tiny bit easier for someone to um, understand the specifics of this volunteer opportunity? Um, and, you know, what is one way I could do that? And that is a great place to start because I know some of this can feel like a lot like digital onboarding and training that can feel like a much longer term project to maybe take on. Um, but making something just a little bit easier for people to to read on your on your website or even um, just establishing a web presence um, can be a great place to start. So let's focus on um, some of the benefits and why this could be good um, for your, your program. You know, why would it be worth it to invest time in this at all? Um, and I think that the first one on this list, we, we noticed a lot, um, especially through, you know, the height of 2020, um, is just increased program resiliency. So some of these creative options, like offering just another layer of, of um, a way to connect with your program can really sort of help keep things a little more like 
moving fluidly and resiliently, resiliently through challenging times. Um, one of my favorites is increased accessibility um, because there are a lot of people who there's, I always like to think there's more people than I can even think of that are interested in contributing to this organization. That's the way I always look at it. And I just have to figure out a way to make it possible for them. Um, so for, for me, like I would say increased accessibility is, um, is brilliant for um, folks with different accessibility needs. And then also people who move through different cycles of their life and may have a fluctuation of how challenging it is at different times to, um, to show up on site, right? Um, and we and then, talked about this a little bit just off hand where I was telling you about um, going to get my hair cut. And I was kind of, I was surprised because the, the hair salon I was at still wanted people to wear masks. And for me, I was like, but those are gone. We're done with masks. But then in my head, I was like, oh, wait, you know, this is someone whose livelihood requires them that if they, you know, got sick, they're going to be unable to work for two weeks. So I think there's this piece of program resiliency and increasing accessibility that we've all had to in the last, you know, two years, figure out new ways to do things. And then I think the challenge is thinking about which of those ways should linger. Because I know, as Court was saying, if the increased accessibility, if I've created something that people can do from their homes or that they can take with them to you know, bring to their book club, bring to their work, bring with them to an environment where they get to kind of introduce it to someone remotely versus it all has to happen on site, that change of where things have to be done and how they can be done by myself with a group, from my home, on site. I think really examining your accessibility from timing to a task to what's a great first opportunity that is accessible to so many people. And then as they keep showing up for that opportunity, I'm gonna open up that next door so I can really stage myself to say, I don't have to get them all the way through a background check and an interview. And now I know the first name of their you know, mother-in-law. Like all of that doesn't have to happen in my first step. I need to think about simple ways to let people take a step, one step. And then if they took that step, what's a good second step? And I think bearing in mind that we're all coming from different places where livelihoods are at stake, health is at stake. Some of us have different levels of concern about that. I think keeping as much accessibility so that everyone can engage with where they're comfortable to Court's point, you know, imagining there's a pool of people that all want and care about this cause. They want to bring their resources to it. So if I have ways to be able to keep it manageable, can't do everything for everyone, but thinking through what are those things that I can manage on a repeat basis that still allow me some new avenues to engage in a way that I wasn't doing five years ago. I think that's a really good piece to really sit down with a piece of paper and chart it out. What did I try? What did people really respond to? And it surprised me how quickly they responded to that. How can I keep that element going? And what was it about that element? Was it the task? Was it the flexibility of time? Was it who they could do it with? Like, what was it that the people participating really enjoyed and, and were able to make impact around. Yeah, absolutely. And who really benefits is your community, right? Mm -hmm. um, consistent consistency with programs and services, connection, awareness of your cause, attention to your cause. And then of course your volunteers benefit, right? For those um, with busy schedules or who need different types of opportunities to participate. Um, you could have somebody going through a specific season in their life where maybe they had shown up on site every week for four hours and now that's not possible for them, but they miss you they care about you like what's another way that you can keep them looped in um and i think that because community we have learned over and over again is one of the number one reasons why your volunteers show up um so what are the common challenges of virtual volunteerism retention i think that's a challenge that is always there for volunteer managers promoting repeat volunteerism um, from your virtual volunteers, or even, you know, an increased engagement level from your volunteers. Um, some of the challenges I think we spoke to a little bit earlier is just recognizing that there's particular systems um, in, that need to be in place, and that can feel a little bit overwhelming um, to get all of those in place, right? Like recruiting systems, onboarding, training, tracking, and doing that in a way that makes it quick and accessible, that can feel like a daunting task, mm -hmm. um, which is why just one thing at a time, you know, um, and then volunteer burnout, right? A lot of people um, 
maybe staying in communication digitally, this feels like a lot. And it feels we've all been on a lot of screens over the past couple of years. We probably saw a dramatic increase in our screen time. Um, and so there is, you know, sort of also this sort of secondary cause of um, screen fatigue. And so being aware of that and learning how to, um, you know, build in healthy systems and also talking to your volunteers about knowing when to step away from the screen um, and knowing when to take a break and knowing how to pace yourself on certain activities. Those could be like really great points of conversation to have with them um, because it is a really common challenge that people are running into. And then just engagement. How do you stay in that active, connected conversation where they really feel like they're a part of your organization? and what's important. Um, again, this is a top challenge that we see occurring um, for all of our volunteer managers, just like retention, but just that engagement piece of like, how do you feel? Because a lot, a lot of us start um, working in these fields because we care about the cause and we really love engaging people. And so it can be really challenging to not have that person-to-person -person contact in a way that you know, feels like the community feeling we're used to feeling. And so now we're just kind of trying to translate certain aspects of that engagement process into a, um, a more virtual and digital world. I think that's the piece too that um, I think we go into a little bit later, but I think quite that part of community, you know, one of the primary reasons people volunteer is to feel like they're part of a community. And I think that piece of, um, it doesn't all live virtually if you have people that want to feel like a community, then how do you incorporate those tangible pieces that were always so important to them? That thank you note, that story, and maybe it's a video now instead of being able to see them in person, but how do you think through doing those things that still create that same level of engagement with them that aren't virtual? Because I think the screen fatigue and everything you just mentioned, Court, like if the virtual lives solely virtually, it does become fatiguing. We don't get that sense of community. So how do we use a new medium to build community and have those strategic touch points that take it off of a screen and incorporate those things that for thousands of years, we've all built community <laughs> around. So I think that's the, that's the, that's the challenge. But it's also kind of the interesting part to hear from this group. You know, what are those things you're doing that you're like, I had a virtual group accomplish this. So this is the tangible way that I you know, sent out that impact result, or this is the way we kept in touch with each other by you know, joining for a virtual coffee hour where we just chit chatted. You know, what are those things that you've tried that went really well? I think that'd be a great thing if anyone has something to share with the group in the chat. I um, wanted to uh, bring up something that actually came up in the chat. Um, CJ uh, brought it up uh, with regard to disabled or chronically ill people. And yeah. You know, a couple of minutes ago, we were talking about accessibility, and now we're talking about community. And I think it kind of goes both ways when we're talking about virtual volunteerism um, for folks who may have compromised immune systems and, you know, need to be in safe environments uh, where they previously may have come in person before. I think having these opportunities is really appealing. Uh, but then for folks who just may not have had opportunities to engage in volunteering at facilities that don't have a ramp or yeah. uh, don't have accommodations for them, but wanna have that community engagement, um, it provides an opportunity for them to do so. And so just wanted to bring that up as a, as a topic that was shared in the chat and an important consideration. Yeah. I Thank you. On the note too, Mike, I mean, the word choices, you know, I think wheelchair accessible is one word choice, but having someone who's part of that community read over your posting to be like, would, would this feel like something you could respond to? Do I need to word this differently? So you know that your health concerns are taken into consideration or did this, this read is something that you felt comfortable participating in. I think it's again, back to what Courtney and I said, grab that person that isn't writing it with you and have them read it either because they are part of that community or because they just need to challenge you on, I don't think you're saying that court. I don't think that's what this says to me if I read it and I didn't know what you were trying to accomplish. So I think that great points that those people are what makes virtual better. So. Absolutely. Um, more voices, the better. I actually just had a conversation with someone who had been invited to a volunteerism opportunity and had a number of questions about accessibility for their needs. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I said, 
you need to talk with the organizer. And, you know, of course, there, there sometimes is fear about that, you know, bringing that up because of being met in the past with not, um, you know, not understanding or not kindness. And I was really excited to hear that same volunteer sent me a message the other, the other day and said, you wouldn't believe it. I was just met with so much um, support and accessibility that absolutely met my needs. And so I think because of previous experiences, they, they didn't know that that was even possible. And so when they spoke to this volunteer coordinator and found everything they needed was going to be there, um, it was just, it was a really joyful experience for this volunteer, knowing that they would get to participate in this, um, this really important to them cause um, weekend activity. And so I think, you know, when I think about all of these pieces of communication, um, I think that's a lot of what we're working on is how do we become better communicators? How do we um, listen? How do we use the different tools that we have? You know, I feel like I have a lot to learn and it's a constant study. Um, try to just deep, deep breaths, <laughs> take it one step at a time and just use the mindset that there's always something um, new to learn. There's always a way I could just slightly change this opportunity to make it even more of an open door um, to the, you know, the whole community. Mm -hmm. um, because again, I really try to take that mindset of there are so many people out there who want to help your cause and who care about your cause. They just don't know quite how to yet. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why I think that this conversation is really important. And I think like in looking at the way different roles and opportunities, um, you know, for virtual volunteers, hybrid, remote, and even micro volunteers, which we did a really fun webinar on micro volunteerism as well. And, you know, some really great things like a remote volunteer. Well, somebody might sign up for it virtually, right? Like I'm going to collect, pick up, drop off or distribute items. So they might never really be active on your site, except for when they're dropping things off. Perhaps they sign up remotely, um, they sign up virtually, and then all the work they do is just on their own time, and they just make sure that the boxes are dropped off at your location, and they're in, they're out. And so that's a person that you might not see a whole lot, but they're active, right? Um, administrative support is a great way people can help. Writing and proofreading, there are plenty of people out there who love doing that type of work, um, especially for emails or, um, you know, somebody who's skilled in writing could help you write your virtual volunteerism opportunities on your website. Mm -hmm. Pro bono roles are a really great example of this, um, getting, you know, those skilled volunteers from, you know, local companies or businesses um, that they might come in on a project basis, you know, and do some like marketing, some graphic design for you, and they might not necessarily need to be there. Um, so it actually kind of opens you up to people locally and further away from you. Mm -hmm. um, translation support is a really great example of this. There's a number of organizations um, using translation support or um, national um, organizations also that are using chat support um, to help people with their causes. And those volunteers are all over the place. Um, Zoom tutoring. And then like thinking about fully virtual things, you know, like data entry, that's like a very traditional virtual volunteer sort of thing. Email management, administrative work. One of my favorite things, because I love social media, <laughs> is social media management or social media marketing. And one of the things that I noticed, um, this was kind of fun. I was sort of looking at a few different local organizations to see, do they have any opportunities on their websites that are listed as virtual or listed as remote? And I know like when you look at things like, you know, um, where you have to be on site, right? You're building a house or you're um, packing boxes of food, right? Those are very physically labor intensive, but you could, if you're in an organization like that, or even if an animal shelter, right? It's like walking the dogs, cleaning the cages, like all of those things, you could have like a social media ambassador program where you've just got a, a whole group of people who their only job is to just boost everything that you're sharing publicly. Yeah. That's a great virtual or remote opportunity or even a hybrid opportunity, right? Because you could have some of those people that are dog walkers that also want to be a social media ambassador. So there's just like a chance there to really amplify um, your voice and get the word out about your cause. Mm -hmm. So that's um, a good spot to like kind of peek and see like, how am I really you know, talking, talking to our community to um, kind of tap into these 
sort of hidden yeah. opportunities, I guess. Yeah, and I think um, there's a word choice I just saw in the chat, the online attendance, because I was thinking, you know, my parents are in their 70s, so this online attendance wouldn't scare my mother, frankly, as much as virtual volunteerism, where she would be like, that's not for me. So online attendance, what's the word choice that makes someone realize they could be a board member? online attendance options, you know, that moment of being able to take part in a tutoring program and being able to do it through online attendance. I think I love that because it's just a different phrase. I think that would be something else to drop in the chat. Like, what are those words? What are those ways to describe these things? Remote, virtual, online attendance. What are those things that we can incorporate into headers to say, like, if these are skills based, this is marketing. This is going to be something that you can add to a resume. So that's these type of tasks. Here's some things that are leadership based. They're online attendance only, or there's something that you can do in a lunch hour. So thinking through, like, how do I make those things accessible? An ambassador program, micro volunteerism again that first time I heard that terminology I was like oh what is the world is micro volunteerism now there's another one I gotta learn but when I heard it oh it's it's just you know sharing a post it's asking someone to tap into their sphere of influence to get more exposure to a cause that 15 minutes that five minutes that's something I do when I see something that intrigues me naturally so asking someone to do it intentionally and making a program around that is a huge place for your marketing to get more places and more places to go so I, I think that word choice is so critical. And I think anybody who has anything that is really working well, dig into your word choice even more than your process. Once you've got them in a place where they feel comfortable taking a step, then they'll stick with you to get the right step. But you've got to get them to take that first step because they see there's a step that's open and that was meant for them. So I, I love what I'm seeing in the chat. Great, great, great pieces to keep saying this is so vital. It's so important. Yeah. Oh, and sorry. I think for so many people too, I just want to touch on, um, what someone was saying in the chat is that, you know, a lot of people do not want to see online attendance for events go away because, you know, that that has been a really important um, piece of of being a part of things. And so, mm -hmm. um, you know, I've I speak with a lot of people about that very regularly, and that's where the strength of hybrid comes in. Yeah. Is that. Um, okay, some people really want to have things in person, but please don't take away the mm -hmm. virtual option. Um, and that's one of the, the pieces I think is really important when we're talking about we're living in a landscape right now that requires a lot of different points of access and con contact. Mm -hmm. And so um, I do believe that it is really important to think about it in this more hybrid sort of way. Um, and not not as as separate, you know. So I really feel like, and and this is true for me too. My my life in many ways has been more enriched by. Um, oh, agreed, exactly with the virtual op options. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I yeah. I think that a lot of people, it's very important not to miss out on the richness of our full community, um, and to make certain that you know we are offering. Um, you know, ways for people to, to be together, because I actually think many voices um, is better. Yeah. So why is engaging virtual volunteers important for your volunteer program? It ensures volunteers feel connected to your organization and your cause. They continue to come back in whatever way works for them, right? Um, ensures volunteers are well-trained and carry out their roles successfully. And that overall is going to reduce your administrative hours. So just like that's a piece of that engagement is that ongoing training. And, you know, even just checking in with people like every two weeks, like how is remote tutoring going? Um, you know, how are, how are the students you're working with? How are you feeling? You know, and having some of those little touch points of like, what's a win? Um, what was something that was really hard? What's something that you feel like you're growing? Those are great places and ways to really actually engage um, versus just like sending an email that's just like, hey, did you do your hours? You know, it's more like kind of creating that like people volunteer because they they also, you know, have like a sense of growth in it. Um, so yeah, that's a huge part of it. And then making certain that virtual volunteers feel appreciated um, in order to support all of your retention efforts. So this is the piece that I think it's like beyond just the process, Elizabeth, you know, mm -hmm. the registration, like those are like the tangible kind of things. But this is sort of, I feel like engaging volunteers is where the magic happens. 
Um, and I think there's so so many of our tasks are seasonal. You know, I know there's so many you know, back to school programs right now. They get through this huge wave of activity, and they really won't see this need for this type of headcount until next fall. And that idea that you know there's things that we do in the spring, and I how do I engage someone if I'm only going to talk to them three months out of the year? They're not going to be engaged. They go completely cold. And so that idea of engaging them and thinking through how do I build community? How do I share things with, with them? once a month, even if they're not doing something. So they just know I'm part of what they're working on and I'm part of their community. Um, I do think, yeah, it's, it's past that one experience, whether it's a first one and we're gonna, you know, behind the scenes grade, does Court show up on time for virtual opportunities? Mm -hmm. Is she there every single time? Once she's made it four times in a row on time, then I have a next step that I might open that door because I see something in her that I can take a step further. Or, you know, she's just wonderful in her role. And I want to make sure she comes back next spring and does it with me again. So how do I make sure that I have those intentional moments of inviting her to something, you know, having her be part of a recognition program so that she sees that what she did nine months ago really mattered. And that when it comes up again, she's not forgotten that she did it last year. She's ready to do it again. She's ready to be an advocate, participate herself, or spread the word so the more people that care about the same cause as she does join with her this time around. So I think that is so critical to think through. And you only know that by really getting to know court, to get to know the person who took part with you, to be, you know, have those conversations, you know, you are the one and I've got 20 people just like you, what would matter to you? How, how, and what do you want from us so that, you know, we're going to be training again, come next fall, but until then, what would be really helpful for you? What would be really engaging for you? What are the things you want to hear about along the way? And then weave that into what you're thinking about for your touch points. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that some of those touch points have become sort of an expectation as we've seen that like online shopping and um, sort of like this app culture, like people expect to learn a lot before they commit to something. So they expect to be able to learn a lot about what it, what they're committing their time to. We've all recognized that our time is a very precious resource, right? And so um a lot of expectations have shifted. I'm really curious if you've noticed that, um, but really in talking about this volunteer website and um, making sure that, you know, you're delineating between, is this a virtual only? Is this hybrid micro volunteerism opportunity? Also making sure that within those opportunities, you're really clear about what tools are provided, what training is provided um, and any sorts of, you know, accessibility things that we were speaking about that needs to be written clearly so that um, people understand and know and making sure that they know what their next step is. How do they register? How do they train? Who is their point of contact? Um, and then also just sharing your program, marketing uh, your program, sharing the, the word about what you're doing. So a lot of this hybrid digital first world means that um, just like, you know, you would want your, your space, your on-site space to, to look a particular way and to feel a particular way so that people feel welcomed um, and clear um, about where they're supposed to be. It's kind of like, where is your digital space as well? Just because so many people are really, meeting you and your organization and your cause and your opportunities very first online. Um, and sometimes it's even the people that you wouldn't expect. Like there are people, you know, I have family and they're of a generation where they're retired and they would not a few years ago have dreamt of looking online for their volunteerism opportunities. And now it's the first thing they do. Um, and so we've just seen how, how that has changed. And I'm very curious if, if you've noticed that as well. I'm um, sort of anecdotally, we've seen it a lot. Um, Court, let me so have you look at the chat and because I think you'll be able to answer that idea question. Um, I think the other thing I'd point out just to drill that even harder that I was just thinking about while he talked because I'm staring at Mike's face. Um, Mike and I both have kids. So he's got Ezra, I've got my two daughters. And I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mike, I did everything for their summer virtually. We're both about to send them back to school next week, but between camps and things that we're registering for, those websites, those applications, those payments, 
everything was virtual. And that idea that, you know, I'm entrusting my child to these organizations, that's a measure above, you know, coming out myself to volunteer with someone. But it was, if the website didn't have what I needed to know, if I couldn't see the information about the early drop off, or if I could have more than one person pick them up, like all of those things, I moved on to the next one. It had this moment of attention and the website either told me what I needed to do, I could pick up a phone, but most of the time you couldn't get anybody on the phone. So that moment of the website has to be that place where you're answering a lot of those strategic questions. I think, again, we're talking a lot about volunteer programs, but I think making sure, and we've heard this in others, it's hard for a volunteer programs sometimes to have the strongest voice with your organization's marketing team. But I think bringing in that outsider perspective to say, you know, volunteerism is a front door to a lot of what we are working on. Can a volunteer see who we are and how they can come through and what is available to them on our website? If they can't, then you have really cut the legs down to a very small scope for what a volunteer can, coordinator can be able to access. So I think really getting some leadership buy-in that that website front port front page that, you know, if you've gotten to a volume where the portal is now necessary, so you need to bring in you know, something like what we do with volunteer management software, those pieces have to have buy-in from leadership because you are a very large front door to the organization. And if I can't read the sign on the front door to understand what happens when I walk through it, I will go find another door. And we have absolutely created a culture where we can jump to the next website so easily. Yeah. Um, so, that, hey, uh, yeah, that's good. Yeah, there's a few uh, comments in the chat uh, most recently about um, getting stuck with coming up for tasks that folks can do online. And so, uh, Court, I think you'll be getting to that at some point, but just, just wanted to mention it as a topic. Um, and specifically, uh, Casey Weed mentioned um, coming up with opportunities uh, for folks that might not be able to come to the facility or that uh, you know, might be far away. Um, that will engage folks, but but uh, won't cause a crisis if the activity doesn't happen for some reason mm -hmm. or doesn't go off without a hitch. And uh, it's a pretty important subject for sure when thinking about what to what to delegate to the internet. Yeah, that's these are really great questions. And you know what? I love brainstorming ideas. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, I think a couple of things that come to my mind, not knowing you know, not knowing um, really super well exactly what your organization does. But my first thing is, is there an opportunity for someone to create an educational experience about your cause? Um, because that's, you know, what we are doing here. We've got an educational experience that's online. And I think that that is like a model that um, a lot of people use to connect with their communities and their, you know, desired um, volunteers is like, how can I create an educational experience to share um, once a month and talk a little bit about what it is we do and why we feel it's important. And that um, there's a really great article we've got in our learning center um, about being beyond, beyond direct service. And so it just has a lot of really creative ideas of different ways that people um, can help and support um, that might be a little different than some of the traditional, you know, hour to hour volunteerism, you know, like, can somebody distribute pamphlet pamphlets for you? Well, that's a remote volunteer opportunity. And um, we talked about, you know, sharing posts, but an educational experience, or could someone make a video for you? You know, could somebody actually create some of those pieces of writing that you're sharing in the first place? Um, that would be some of what I would suggest. Um, and I think, I think some of those projects in a boxes too, if you've seen yeah. some of those, whether it's, you know, just a something needed in a classroom. So you're you're working to organize it for them or cut it up before it can be laminated. I think, you know, I saw the animal question there. Yeah, you know, I've, I've seen some kids doing that for their birthday parties in lieu of presents. You know, I've chosen Brother Wolf and we're gonna be collecting, you know, canned food and the food that they've recommended to bring into the animals. So it becomes an advocacy for the child. And they also have something they're collecting and it's tangible. I think you know, those education experiences can be what we're doing here, but they can also be like, how do I tell a story of an animal that's gone through 
this point to a place where it was rehabilitated to this point or a person or a child, whatever it is that's a tangible story that can go with it so that it's not just cutting up squares to be laminated and it's not just, you know, being able to do a, a food drive for pets, but it's seeing a story of, you know, this is going to help support the organization from a resource standpoint, but really it's creating that advocacy. I can now tell the story, my kid feels good because they participated with me or I feel good because I brought it to a group of women and we did it together instead of you know just talking about the book whatever it is you know that moment of starting to build a community around a discussion point that then you're also following up with that virtual volunteer to say what was what was the conversation like like what were the questions that were raised what did they want to know about what we could do next beyond what they heard about that day that can be just a lead into frankly having someone who's in your donation pool having somebody who's into your board one day doing those very strategic skill sets as court mentioned for project that you could never hire someone to create these new training videos. It's, it, it, I will encourage all of you, Court and I are not presenting experts, she more so than myself. And starting to do these series was like, we just got to try. Let's see if anybody listens. Let's see how it goes. And they've gotten better. And then, you know, the design has gotten better. But that first one was just us trying it. And I think a lot of our communities and our volunteers they're not judging whether or not we were perfectly well-spoken and was the content there. It was, was there a caring individual that was trying to inform? And maybe it is just you doing a quick recording of yourself in Zoom, being like, I don't get to meet you in person at the door, but I wanted to say thank you. And here's what I need you to remember. And here's why what you're doing matters so much to us. And here's what you're gonna see from me as a follow-up so that you know, you know, we did get that delivered and this is how it mattered. You know, I think those pieces of just trying it gets better as you go but that yeah. first step is so hard to do it because you just feel so like I don't know if we're going to be any good I don't know if I can do this I think you'd be surprised what you can do and then what you can start to improve upon versus taking that first step is sometimes just so hard I got off on a tangent. <laughs> Absolutely. And and sort of when I look at the, this like piece of engaging virtual volunteers, like access online, marketing and outrage, communications follow-up, these are just sort of the ways that you try, try again. And the ways that you continue to cultivate that community, because like what Elizabeth is saying, you know, that's what people care about. Am I going to do everything perfectly all the time and make sure I hit every point? Probably not. Might I disappoint, um, you know, a couple of people along the way? Absolutely. But I have the ability to say, I'm sorry, I'm trying. How can I do better? I'm, I really want this to, um, to be solid. And I think sometimes that's like the, the most challenging actually part. It's not necessarily these like, you know, website and all of these things, although that can feel very daunting, but sometimes it is just that um, community conversation of like, we're all trying um, to do our best here and it, it takes all of us. Um, and I love some of the examples that are coming through, um, you know, about virtual volunteers um, reading to kids. That's an amazing um, program. And then, oh yes, we've got a hybrid activity also coming through. Fundraising, marketing, mailings, putting packets together. That's great. Um, and all the pieces needed, beautiful. Pick up, drop off, love it, love it. Um, these are really creative ideas. And, and it's interesting because some of these remote or hybrid opportunities might be 100% managed online, 100% um, accessible online. So, um, you know, making, making things virtual, um, uh oh, my little window box moved. <laughs> I can't do it anymore. Hang on one second. It'll pause the share. Um, but making things virtual and making sure that things are accessible online. So our instructions clear, right? So if you've got, um, you know, like a marketing mailings project, just making sure that people know like what needs to be in there um, and making sure all of that is accessible online. And do you have this online registration? I made this little graphic, which I thought was really fun. Um, this is some of um, the organizations that we work with through Get Connected. Um, and I just thought that a few of these were really great examples of, you know, putting a spotlight on some of these opportunities and making sure like it's findable. Um, because when I was looking at a lot of different examples, I found that 
it wasn't always clear when I looked at um, different websites and even some local organizations if there were any opportunities that were virtual or remote. So making sure that you understood um, what's really fun too is that you can sometimes make these things very searchable like on our um, volunteer sites through Get Connected, you can actually tag these things as virtual opportunities, and then people can search for them. Um, but I also think, you know, having it in the headline, um, having it in the description, it's remote, remote information, you know, the skills, it involves technology, you need to be able to talk to people, things like that. Um, Oh, I love that idea too. So how could you, translation services? Oh, that's brilliant. Um, and then also how could you work with senior staff, volunteers and residents? How could virtual volunteers and programs be incorporated into facility activities? Maybe like the tutoring or the reading, that would be really great. Um, I was gonna say too, it, I've seen some, um, some high schoolers at a local church take kind of an overview video of everything that happens at an event and then they compile it into kind of that fun slideshow that can be shared. I think if you think about anyone in a veterans program or in a retirement community, like seeing kids, seeing those stories, seeing fun things that are happening in the community, that can be one of those tasks that you might get a college student or somebody who has editing of, you know, they love doing stuff with you know, TikTok. I don't know how to use TikTok, but they can use TikTok or they can do fun things like that kind of idea of like, give me something that they can sit down and watch for five or 10 minutes, very simple, but that will show like kids out having a great time or what happened at a local Easter egg hunt and put that into something that then can be shared with that community that needs to feel like they are still seeing what's happening around them or remembering things that does remind them of more active memories, especially with the retirement community. I sort of like the idea too of maybe having sort of a pen pal program. Mm -hmm. You could have, you know, handmade cards and letters go back and forth, or, um, you know, a, a volunteer or staff member could facilitate making a video or receiving a video. Um, so that's also a fun idea. And I feel like for sharing some of these programs, I love social media, of course, email with a regular newsletter um, and follow up emails. Group meetings via Zoom can just be a coffee talk. It doesn't have to be an hour long. It can be 15, 20 minutes, just a coffee talk check-in. Um, and just having short little things like that available with some level of regularity, um, creating engaging videos. I'm a big fan of doing fun things like live streaming, um, especially if it's like a remote or a hybrid or virtual opportunity. You could just say, hey, I'm getting the books ready today. We'll be mailing these out. These are the stories you're gonna read virtually. Like, you know, something fun like that, like make communication fun and, um, and that's engaging too. So I always try to tell myself, like, if I'm ever feeling stressed about something I have to do for work, I just say, how can I make this a little bit more fun? And sometimes it helps me be a little more outgoing when I put myself out there for some of these things, right? Um, and it's also really helpful if you can find other organizations to partner with and spread the word um, using the power of digital communication. So if you're working with a local school, um, partner with them and cross-pollinate and share some things. Do love the intergenerational virtual book club. That's a great idea. Um, and then just regular communication cycle, because that's a huge challenge with the engagement. And after this webinar on Monday, we'll send out the follow-up recording, and you'll also receive a virtual volunteers and planning guide that's going to help you answer some of these questions for yourself, but also has a fun um, just little example calendar for what would a communications um, cycle look like for keeping your volunteers engaged um, and wanting them to participate. You know, you kind of want to intersperse regular intervals of volunteer appreciation, um, meetups, live streams, check-ins, and, and surveys are really great too. All right, I know we're coming to the close of our time, and I want to make sure we have just a few minutes. Um, Elizabeth, if you want to read through those first couple of takeaways, that would be great. Yeah, so you've got your evaluate your opportunities. So I think, again, it's the homework. It's the after action, just sitting down and taking that minute to say, you know, what are we offering? Is there space for these to have an online attendee? Are there new opportunities that I can add that would be more skills-based that are more flexible? Um, as far as the accessing your online presence, I think we've, we've hit this enough, but it's the idea you should do it and then actually challenge yourself to get somebody who doesn't know what anything that you are doing or your program is doing and make them be like, what do you think we do? What do you think you should do off of this page? Where do you think you should click? What do you think your next step is? Do you feel like you know enough to show up by yourself to do this? That fresh set of eyes is critical. And then building community engagement, you're sharing in your volunteer newsletter, you're offering pictures, 
I know my sister works for a, a nature center and they are always doing photo contests. But really, I think what she's doing is just creating media. One, people love to share photos, but she uses these photos and she puts them into her next post. So she's got this, you know, I mean, it is animals. She has a little bit of a leg up. But that moment of like, they're just really fun. And she's cultivating engagement with a community that's sending her their pictures, voting on their favorite picture. When you have something like that, even, you know, we've talked in other ones about just something that's creative. Like, what's the stack of books that I donated measurement wise? I did 11 inches, Court only did 10. You know, that challenge and getting your kind of pool thinking about what they're doing with each other and sharing it with each other. Now it's not all on you. It's them starting to take what went well and pre-populating it, repopulating it and getting it out to more places. So that community is so important and inviting fresh faces because you never know who's sitting off camera now. You never know who they know that they're going to meet at the mailbox. And Elizabeth, if you want to go through our little bonus take action, because I feel like it's kind of similar to what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so I, I think this is the other thing, just we've all learned to do it, those Zoom groups. How do you host a virtual meetup that people want to attend? If it's every single time the instructions on what to do when they do their volunteerism, they are only going to attend it once. So how do you do something more? As Court said, maybe it's a coffee meetup. Maybe it's everybody brings their favorite piece of artwork from their home, and they're going to show that on camera to talk about. So they're getting to engage with each other, um, those check-ins being text or video, the live stream piece. Um, I do think all of those too, if you're not comfortable with it, somebody is. Somebody's kid is, somebody's local intern is, is somebody who's in business to create things. And you could say, hey, I love this for mine. Can I give you some corporate recognition if you came in and helped me record my first video or did something with me for my audience? Look for where you can get resources because I do not have all the talents. That's where I have my team to be like, does anybody know how to do this? And mm -hmm. that's when then I get so much more than what I can bring to play by myself. Um, but yeah, I, th I think we all learned the things, you know, scavenger hunts online, anything that's fun, just what can we do to let somebody share how it's going and sometimes what they failed at, what went really badly last week, or <laughs> what they're really proud of last week, you know, those failures and those successes, if we're coming together, then we're going to learn from each other and we're going to move forward together versus leaving somebody feeling isolated and unable to say, I can't do this step. As soon as I say, I can't do this step, if Mike turns in and says, I can't do it either, mm -hmm. then everybody's like, oh, this is the step we can't do. Let's brainstorm together. Let's figure out, was there an instruction missing? Um, so yeah, I think all of those things are, are so critical to just really learn together and, and feel fast, but also celebrate those successes because people do want to feel like they're success and they do want to know what they're doing matters. So figuring out how can you relay one big impact story to all, even if I, I can't tell Court exactly how hers went, how Mike's went, how mine went, but if I can have something that I'm sharing that everybody's going to be like, yeah, what we're doing matters. Think about your efforts and your timeline and really make your steps achievable for what you can take on and then what you can ask somebody else to take on with you because you're only one person. Yeah. And it, I think that's true. Like, again, like tap into your community because you could sit down and have a brainstorming session, use the planning guide that we're going to provide for you. Yeah, that was um, really well done, Court. I saw it yesterday. Nice job. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah, it was good. So um, use that planning guide that we're going to email out to you on Monday. Sit down with um, one of your lead volunteers or someone on your team and see if you can come up with something because um, that is the most challenging part is we do what we do and we do it every day. And so sometimes we have to look at our, our own um, work with fresh eyes. And that's the hardest part, I think, especially adapting, adapting to this digital first hybrid world. But I do feel that the benefits are there um, to really amplify your mission and what you're doing and um, that the challenges are worth it. Uh, to be able to, um, you know, really communicate and allow more participation. Um, so there could be 20 people right now that are connected to your organization um, that just haven't served yet because there hasn't been something um, like a virtual remote or hybrid opportunity or even a micro volunteerism opportunity, which I'll have in the follow-up resources as well. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much uh, for your time and your attention. We value you. We know that volunteer managers are very busy. Thank you to all of the volunteer managers who shared in the chat. Um, you know, it's vulnerable to say like this work, this doesn't, didn't work, or this is hard. I understand that. I feel, I feel vulnerable a lot, but I just want to say thank you because um, being a part of this community is very, very important. Um, and I love to see you all 
chatting with each other and getting the opportunity to be here. And again, um, we're Galaxy Digital and we are the creators of Get Connected, um, our best in class volunteer management software. And so if you're interested in learning more about that, you can email us at info at Galaxy Digital or head to our website, galaxydigital.com. And we will be sending you tons of resources from our volunteer management blog, our learning center that will be coming your way. And so, so grateful for your time and attention. Um, you will get the PowerPoint, you will get the recording, and you will get all the bonus resources and the planning guide as well. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Um, I think so. Really lovely to see you today. What's the that? last thing I saw in the chat, just asking what we do, I think um, start with what you need. Figure out what do you need for engagement? What do you need for managing your volunteers? What do you need to keep them engaged? Once you have that, and there's some really critical place, places that um, Court and her team have actually put together buyer's guides, like how do you figure out what you really need? Then to the question of what we do, we do management software. So it's not just finding your volunteers, it's how do you manage them? How do you communicate with them? How do you stay engaged with them and show them new things within an environment that can spotlight new things to them as they come up? So new opportunities for service based on what they're good at or what their accessibility is. So management software, absolutely to the question in the chat, like we pull that all together, but I think it's always good to have that self-reflection step of going through what is it I need this year? What am I managing? What do I need? And that's a lot of what these webinars are focused on is helping you figure out what's critical for your organization. Once you know that, you'll know whether or not our product's the best fit or if there's something else that you actually need first. Um, and I think that I appreciate that with what Court you said in the learning center and the blogs and the content, like a lot of it is just really good, healthy content to understand and explore with. And then you can take that step forward into figuring out what is the right website? What is the right management tools? What do I need to get it done? Um, so yeah, again, thank you all so much for coming and, and spending your hour with us. I know you have a lot on your plates, so we always appreciate it so much when you take, take this time to, to be with us and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Absolutely. And thank you so much to um, Mike for his debut today. On Thanks the everybody. You did all right. <laughs> <laughs> I think you did pretty good, Mike. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Bye.